And this month's Where Did the Road Go is sponsored in part by Allison Cook, Super Inframan, and Eric Hervin. Thank you all so much for your support. And if you want to become a patron and help support Where Did the Road Go, you can do so at wheredidtheroadgo.com. It's only $3 a month. You get extra content all month. You can also support the show through donations off the website or pick up some merch, all available at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? Tonight I have back with me Jay Douglas Kenyon. Hey, hey there. All right. And uh, your latest book, which we already covered one part on, is Ghosts of Atlantis, How the Echoes of Lost Civilizations Influence Our Modern World. And this is out on Inner Traditions and has been out since when? I think I uh, went up in April, I believe. Okay. So, so not that long ago. No. Not in the cosmic scheme of things. <laughs> well, you know, like time just doesn't seem to work the same anymore either. You got a point. So, all right. Uh, so uh, let's 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 talk about some of the other stuff in the book here that I found really interesting. Um, well, actually, one of the things you mentioned, I don't know how much you can speak about it, was uh, that there was a discovery that some stars have turned to crystal. Um. Well, this was, uh, I, I, I'm not a good source on this because I was quoting uh, research mostly from Japan, uh, from, uh, and um, there is um, evidence that um, I feel really, uh, I, this is uh, out of my depth on this particular subject, uh, but uh, we were trying to make the point that, uh, as they were, that many stars are actually in the process of, of becoming crystals. And, uh, and I think that there's therefore evidence that uh, that might account for some of, the, uh, some of their attributes and some of the uh, factors that we observe. Uh, and if, I mean, I was trying to make a pretty broad point about crystals. Uh, right. I mentioned there was um, uh, this cave in Mexico where they have these gigantic crystals that are like yeah. 30 and 40 feet long uh, that, uh, uh, of course, they're almost inaccessible because it's very, very hot in there where they are. And uh, even though they've been uh, photographed and, and people, it's, it's very difficult for uh, people to get in there and get close to them. Yeah, but it's, it's dangerous, it's, yeah. In my view, this is just kind of a, a, a kind of a metaphor for um, for something that uh, that goes on in um, uh, you might say natural science, uh, primarily the way crystals form. And I mentioned in the book, and uh, there was a uh, a book that uh, influenced me a great deal in the in the 60s. I enjoyed it. Was the by the uh, 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 I, uh, the uh, science fiction writer, now I can't think of his name. Uh, Asimov? Wrote, uh, what's that? Was it Asimov? Not Asimov. No, this is uh, uh, much more, uh, not quite so such a big name, but uh, um, I'm terrible with names, and it's not getting any better, I must say. Yeah, I have uh, the same problem. <laughs> it'll, 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 it may come to me in the middle of things, and right. if it does, I'll, I'll interrupt myself <laughs> and tell you what it was. Uh, uh, I remember one of his books was uh, Cat's Cradle. Oh, Vonnegut. Uh, yeah, Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut. Yep. Exactly. And he had some really curious ideas, some very interesting things. But in in Cat's Cradle, he he had this idea of what he called uh, 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 Ice Nine, which yeah. was a, a a which was a a, a form of uh, crystal or, or a form of water. That would freeze 
at room temperature. So yeah. He was talking the point how various isotopes would uh, uh, can be created that would have different characteristics, like different freezing points and so forth. And so, uh, in his story, uh, the ironic conclusion of it was that uh, someone drops a few drops of this ice nine into the ocean and uh, very quickly the entire oceans all the water of the planet freezes yeah <laughs> and so that was the end of things but uh, actually vonnegut had a lot of very interesting ideas about uh, about other worlds i don't know if you sounds like you're familiar with them so yes yeah I, i'm definitely that. familiar with cat's cradle that's one of my favorites from him yeah, and there's a, that was one of a series there that uh, where uh, uh, where he speculated on some of the very things that uh, that we're talking about. Huh. All right. Um, let, let, let's let's talk about the Neanderthals. Um, of course, back you know thirty forty years ago, Neanderthals were thought to be these primitive people uh, that were beneath us, basically in the in the uh, evolutionary line. But that's over the last you know few decades, that's completely changed. Right. We had an interesting piece by um, uh, Colin Wilson, and in, in fact, he wrote uh, two or three times on the subject for us, and uh, he believed that uh, if you really want to look at um, uh, the history of uh, he thought we had a missing 100,000 years of history and that it was largely the work of the of Neanderthals. And, of course, uh, there's uh, Stan Gooch, who is, is the uh, author who's had the most to say on the subject, but uh, the idea that um, the more intuitive side of, of knowledge was something that that was their, that was their main... Uh, trick that was the yeah. thing that they that they were good at and therefore uh the the evidence that we see of a kind of uh soft technology rather than a uh, than the kind of hard technology that uh, our society has produced is uh and that uh, was what was what they was their their achievement and uh if you really wanted to know what was possible you this is something you had to tune into hmm and, and and we know, of course, you know, as we've discovered, there's there's a very spiritual side to Neanderthals and such that no one expected, you know, like I that's said, the, fifty years ago. That's the intuitive uh, yeah. map that we're talking about. Yeah. So I mean that that's something big that has changed in our history that at least has been acknowledged. Um, uh, talk a little bit about the Carpathian Sphinx because I'm not that familiar with this. Well, it's a it, it's a um, I have an article by uh, Robert Schock, who, who actually talks about this. It's, a, uh, it's one of those um, natural formations that uh, sometimes people call a yardang, or a, it's something that basically is it, it's, it's credited to natural forces, but it looks for all the world like the saints. Huh. And you, if you, and in fact, if you, in our uh, forgotten which issue it was of Atlantis Rising, we have some good pictures uh, of it, and it's called and it's called the, the Carpathian Sphinx largely because it looks like a sphinx, and uh, and uh, uh, Shock wrote an article with in I forgot who he wrote it with, uh, uh, someone who was. Uh, he, a very uh, a Ru uh, a Euro Romanian Romanian uh, uh, researcher uh, who also believed that it was. Uh, I mean, Carpathia was a region of uh, Romania that some people associate with uh, uh, esoteric history, mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, it gets associated with uh, some of the. Uh, some of the darker stories, like uh, that that people talk about, but there is actually uh, uh, there's another side to that uh, that uh, where you have um, uh, great um, uh, 
teachers of uh, of light who are who operate on etheric levels or operate beyond the physical, and that uh, uh, and some of this uh, in esoteric lore is associated with uh, with this particular uh, region of uh, of Romania and uh, central central Europe. There, uh, I, that's about as much as I can say on the subject with any degree of credibility. It's <laughs> it's much deeper than I can than I can really do justice to. Okay, uh, I've got a we've got a few interesting comments I think in the book though. Yeah, yeah, well, absolutely. Um, you you also talk about a his, the the connection between Atlantis and the historical Jesus, which I didn't realize there was any connection there. Well, the the connection that we're trying to make, of course, is that uh, is that uh, there is first a connection between Christianity and the ancient Egyptian religion, and mm-hmm. that there's this parallel between, say. Uh, uh, there's similarity between, say, the story of Osiris, right, and and uh, particularly, and maybe the story of uh, of uh, uh, the uh, the uh, Isis mm-hmm. and and her uh, and parallels with uh, with uh, uh, Mother Mary from the Christian tradition, and certainly there's a very strong case to be made that. Uh, that Christianity is really another uh, is taking the ancient Egyptian religion and reformatting it to a different for a different audience, and therefore, and that the story therefore uh, has been we know that uh, that uh, it this is pres- has been preserved in uh, uh, in the Egyptian religion, and so. Uh, there's therefore uh, there's a you know uh, a, a priesthood and a uh, an entire uh, intuitive uh, uh, understanding of uh, I'm referring to the symbolist view yeah. of of uh, of, uh, of Egyptian uh, knowledge and therefore. And so you have a uh, you have a lineage and a priesthood and so forth that was uh, uh, preserved through uh, the Egyptian uh, tradition and uh, and that uh, what the 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 secret behind in Christianity behind uh, is that um, this was really the animating animating uh, uh, ideal that was leading the development of of, uh, of Christianity, and therefore the and the Jesus under that interpretation uh, can be uh, seen as a uh, as a priest priest king and so forth. Mm. Uh, I mean uh, the uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, of talk about if, how this. Egyptian uh, Egyptian mythology is basically uh, closely re- or, or, or the history of uh, the history of Christianity or the history of of, uh, of Judaism and it, the Hebrew tradition is uh, it's hard for people to find the historical source for this, but then when you look at it and you can see that. Uh, that uh, that Egyptian history was basically uh, that was the same story, but the names were changed. Right. And I, therefore, uh, go ahead. Oh, I remember accounts of uh, statues being dug up all over Europe that were assumed to be uh, Jesus and Mother Mary, and they turned out to be uh, uh, Isis and Horus. Yeah. And that's the same... That's because those are the, the the same archetypes yeah. that are appearing in 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 different forms, and um, uh, that's the uh, that's the point there. All right. Um, 
So for Atlantis itself, I mean, first of all, what do you think Atlantis was? Well, I think of it I, uh, more in terms of the, the greater Atlantis, and I don't identify it with any particular place, though obviously the story of, from Plato is the closest thing we have to, uh, to, a, to uh, actual history uh, and, a dis- and description of, uh, of the people involved. But I tend to think that uh, we're, we're talking about a civilized order that was um, planet-wide and that, uh, that uh, because the oceans were at a significantly lower level than they are now, in coastal regions all over the world, you have um, uh, you have the remains uh, you you have of a of an order that was destroyed, right. and that uh, the I don't I don't think you can oversimplify that. I mean, it's uh, I I suspect that it was just as complicated then as as uh, any world or if you talked about any world order today. You would be talking about something uh, uh, just as uh, just as complicated, and, right? Uh, and uh, and I think that's the way you have to look at it. Yeah, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, there are a lot of theories out there about where Atlantis might have been. I've never I've never bought is it is it, uh, is it Crete or Minoa that one of the explanations. Uh-huh. Yeah, you're talking about in the in the Mediterranean there, yeah. the uh, the Minoan civilization essentially. Uh, yeah. That, I mean, and, yeah, go ahead. And no, that, that was the one that uh, where Sant- Santorini and the uh, uh, the volcanic uh, uh, eruption at the island of Thera uh, is we know about, and people want to associate that with uh, with Plato's Atlantis description. Uh, but in order to do that, they have to make some real, uh, do some real violence to the numbers that yeah. Plato left behind. And, uh, and, but they, they feel they can do that, and they usually uh, do it by an order of magnitude, which strikes me as being, the, the, it's being uncalled for. I and mean, Plato was much more uh, precise in, the, in his use of numbers than they give him credit for. Well, not only that, but Plato's date for the sinking of Atlantis corresponds almost exactly with the end of the last ice age. That's right. And that that you know you, you tell me that's that's coincidence. I mean, we suddenly had a massive seawater rise and probably earthquakes and and tidal waves and everything else going on, and this civilization disappeared. But no, he just made that up. Yeah, he was just uh, just a lucky guess. Right. Um. What, what do you think about Ram Flemath's idea of it being in Antarctica? Well, I, you know, I, it's something you have to think about uh, because, uh, I mean, uh, most of uh, Flemath's uh, ideas were based upon the work of Charles Hapgood. Yeah. And I think that Charles Hapgood, and we, and we say a lot about, uh, we have a lot to say about Hapgood in there. He's a very interesting uh, uh, figure. Uh, he was... Uh, a uh, cartographer and made maps and he and his students produced a lot of uh, you know the maps of the ancient sea kings and and so forth but he also uh, had this theory of earth earth crust displacement that uh, that he promoted and uh, and earth uh, let's see what was the name of the book uh, earth's uh, earth uh, i believe is earth was it earth shifting crust or, i think so uh, uh, yeah, it, at, uh, and it was basically pretty much endorsed by Albert Einstein. And, of course, Hapgood himself was uh, highly respected, was an advisor to, uh, uh, to uh, President Eisenhower and, and to others. And basically, uh, and, and this was the idea that, uh, that Hapgood, or excuse me, that Rand Flamoth based most of his his theories about uh, uh, Antarctica on, uh, and he made the point that if you look at Earth from the south and you see the continent of Antarctica, it's right in the center of the uh, of the world ocean, so to speak, 
and um, and there and then of course there's evidence that it was uh, uh, it was uh, mapped or by well you get uh, mainstream sources uh, like uh, Arantius Phineas and so forth like that basically uh, uh, going along with that idea and uh, and of course uh, the Curie Reese map which was um, used by, uh, which was from the, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, military or uh, naval uh, admiral, uh, Puri Reis, basically um, clearly shows a, uh, in my view it's very clear, uh, the coast of Antarctica beneath the ice. Right. And, uh, so... Uh, and that was the map very itself was probably a fragment of a larger map, and uh, there's some evidence that this was actually the map that uh, Columbus used when he was uh, when he was coming here. Mm. But Lamas idea, or, I mean uh, uh, Hapgood's idea, was that the uh, the crust of the Earth had shifted due to. Um, uh, the forces of uh, glacial ice and and so forth, and that it had moved by as much as 15 degrees, and that uh, this, of course, if you if you shift the Antarctic continent by 15 degrees, then suddenly large portions of uh, of the continent are in temperate zones, yeah, and and you could and that could be that could account for uh, for uh, Atlantis, and uh, I thought it was a very interesting idea, and um, uh, I certainly uh, and, and we we in the early days of the magazine we we talked about that a great deal. We had an interesting uh, cover of I think it was issue number seven of Atlantis Rising, where we were showing them bringing up artifacts from way beneath the ice, mm. but whether or not. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, I love that this kind of speculation has always been uh, one of my favorite uh, uh, pastimes since I got into the Atlanta story, and, and uh, that was uh, that was one. And uh, Rand really liked it and and, uh, and promoted it quite a bit on his side. Mm. But he and his wife did some really interesting uh, research on that, and they worked closely with uh, Colin Wilson, by the way. On, yeah. On and. Some of this, the Atlantis blueprint, I believe. Yes, it's called, uh, yes, it is. Is, is, is. Their story there, and that that shows the the orientation of ancient sites to former poles as well as the current pole. Right, yeah. and uh, it's and you can look at uh, uh, the from from Mexico, for example, the uh, uh, the. Uh, the, astro the astronomical alignments there of some of the of the of the pyramid of the sun and the pyramid of the moon and so forth is uh, in uh, uh, Teotihuacan uh, is uh, you can see that it's it was uh, it appears to have been shifted by the number by a number of degrees and uh, I, I think that. The pole shift is not something that can be uh, completely ruled out. Uh, the way no. it is, I, we've had some, we had some good stuff on that more recently by uh, Scott Creighton, who has uh, uh, come up with a lot of uh, of uh, interesting material there, uh, yeah. documenting a, a pole shift. I actually just had Scott Creighton on talking about that. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, he's got some, uh, Scott's, a, Scott's a really good researcher. He really is. I'm always impressed with his work. And I love having him on because he, he really does his work. I mean, he, he follows everything through. He's not just making stuff up. Right. Or, or right. randomly speculating. He's, he's drawing it from history and, and really going out there and doing the, the research. Yeah. Did you see the, uh, the, the uh, well, there's a, an issue the, the, um, uh, we had an issue of Atlantis Rising where that was a cover story talking about uh, his uh, a pole shift ideas, and uh, I highly recommend that to people. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, 
very interesting article on that. Um, as far as other modern locations from Atlanta, oh, and to, to close off with Atlantis too, I mean, modern science acknowledges that during the last ice age, Lesser Antarctica, the part that's closest to South America, uh, was temperate. I mean, that's, that's you know, the ice on the main part of the, the continent may have been there for a few million years, but that area was was not under ice during the last ice age. Yeah, it, it was, uh, there's a, the continent of, uh, is so huge that uh, you really, uh, it's not just uh, a, an island of, uh, uh, of ice, you know, there's just, uh, what is it, the, it's like the second largest continent, it's one of the, one of the, it's, I, I thought it was the it, biggest. It, it, it's very, very large, and people don't really give that uh, uh, full uh, credit when they think about the subject. And it had many, it, it's, its climate, you know, it spans such a large area that uh, it, uh, it, it, you have to it, look at it and, and see many nuances. Yeah. I, I, we were very much interested in the uh, in Lake Vostok for a while. That when that looked like uh, it was a possibility because uh, the suggestion that uh, down underneath the ice, because of the tremendous pressures and so forth involved, you could have an area that would essentially be uh, uh, isolated, uh, un- uh, ice uh, you know ice free, yeah, and basically warmed by geothermal. Uh, sources, and of course, then you get into the whole idea. Well, what uh, what was it the Nazis were up to down there? But right, right. That's another, that's another story. <laughs> and didn't they find some some organisms in Vostok that were not known previously? Uh, they found plenty of of of, of organisms in their in their ice cores, and uh, uh, we did um, we did a uh, story on that. You know you. You're forcing me to to remember details of all kinds. <laughs> That's okay. Of That's all right. That I that I that I've only got kind of I maintain a kind of a sketchy. Sure. Uh, sure. My dad used to say about memory. He said uh, the memory is like an attic, you know, and you keep your you keep a bunch of uh, lumber up there. But after a while, you get to the point where it's, if you're going to put something more in, you got to take something out. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, so and that's what uh, that's where I'm going. Where I, what it seems to be like in my case. <laughs> um, other uh, modern locations that people have speculated with. Um, obviously, the Bahamas are one of the the bigger ones. Yeah. Um, what do you think of that theory? Well, I, you know, it always interested me. I, 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 as I mentioned, one of the big uh, if, things that got me going on this was the screenplay that I wrote oh, yes. in the. In the uh, in the 1980s, and uh, basically it just kind of we just kind of took off on the idea of uh, uh, of a uh, of Poseidia being a uh, in uh, situated in the in the Bahamas because uh, uh, Casey had uh, Edgar Casey had uh, uh, had suggested something like that, and uh, I think a lot of the uh, parts of uh, uh, of Atlantis there uh, may very well have been in that area. Certainly, the Antilles and and some of the other uh, uh, regions in the area uh, could have a. I think. Yeah, I mean, Andrew Collins uh, has speculated that Cuba was essentially is the remains of of. Of Atlantis, right, and and, uh, and you've had a, there's just so many uh, interesting uh, anomalies that have uh, surfaced in the uh, in the Caribbean area. Uh, Greg Little, and I think you said you had talked to him. On, uh, he's he, he's uh, he and his wife uh, have written numerous uh, pieces on the. Uh, following us, uh, they've done a lot of underwater exploration. Yeah, uh, of the in the area, and uh, I think there are there's certainly some anomalies in the 
Bahamas that are very, very hard to explain. Uh, of course, there's the famous Bemini Road, but that, but that's not, not the entire story by any stretch of the imagination. There's a lot of other places in the area that also are very, uh, very s- suspicious. And what, and, uh, what was the Zalitsky discovery near Cuba? Well, that, uh, yeah, I forgot her first name, uh, 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 but uh, she and her uh, exploration company uh, found uh, ra- uh, uh, side scan radar uh, summaries sh- uh, showing what appeared to be um, uh, structures on the ocean floor uh, in an area to the northwest of Cuba. Uh, the problem is that uh, those were there at about 2,200 feet below sea level, and uh, that kind of depth is is pretty hard to explain uh, for uh, uh, for the uh, uh, for that area. So usually, most of the uh, uh, evidence appears to be at a much shallower and much closer to the surface. Yeah, uh, but. It, it, there is, it's we talk about it. I mean, uh, we 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 uh, in the book, as you know, we we basically tell the story, uh, and that's uh, that is one of the stories I think you have to look at. I th- I'm more inclined to I think the more in, the the things that uh, impress me the most now are more off the coast of India. Oh yeah. Also and also. Uh, in uh, the uh, Indonesia there, then uh, Gunan Padang, and and so forth. That I think there's some real, uh, certainly the, it, there's evidence of something going back uh, to uh, the end of the Ice Age. Oh yeah, that, absolutely. And uh, that's what you, and I think it goes much further than that. But. Yeah, Gunan Padang is. Uh, they're saying what thirty thousand years at this point. Some of the stuff was built. Yeah, and that uh, the, you're, that's the uh, the vicinity. It's it's a, it's at least that. It could be uh, could be even older if I understand correctly. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, there, it, the structures that they're seeing there were were built in in several stages. So you get uh, uh, again. I feel like short on details, but uh, uh, it was enough to impress me. Then. There's uh, an archaeologist uh, who has done a lot of research in the area that uh, uh, the shock uh, is very impressed by, and it's the real. He thinks it's the real thing. Yeah. And, but he's been very, and he's very skeptical of a lot of other stuff. But he, he definitely, uh, he definitely uh, thinks that this is the real deal. Yeah, I remember him upsetting people because he said the Bosnian pyramids were natural formations. Right, that's an example of where he he was not impressed. Yeah, and, yeah. and uh, uh, in fact, he was quite uh, quite skeptical on all of that, and, uh, and he, pretty much dismissed it. He ha- he has a very open mind, but he's also very uh, he knows his stuff. So yeah, it's not something you want to. He's a, he's similar to uh, in regard to the um, the structures in uh, Yonaguni. In uh, in Japan, uh, right. which he has also, he uh, both he and West uh, pretty much uh, dismissed the idea that those were actually human uh, 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 human relics or human uh, artifacts, uh, uh, even though they are also very interesting and very impressive looking, and uh, I think that that's one of the reasons why when shock. Uh, uh, Danny Hillman, I believe, is the uh, the archaeologist there from who's uh, written on uh, Gunung Padang, and if Shock uh, uh, basically is very, we, we have an interesting uh, 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 audio and pictorial conversation with with uh, with Shock on our uh, on our YouTube uh, video channel, uh, and if you. Uh, it's it's been fairly popular. I recommend you might, uh, if you want to listen to it uh, at some point, uh, he he talks about the whole uh, Gunang Padang uh, uh, 
area there. Hmm. And and I, if I remember right, Graham Hancock is, is a little more favorable toward Yanaguni, but he, you know, right. it, it, when Shock said they were natural formations, Graham's like, okay. He's like, but I think people used them. And also right. pointed out that there were stone circles nearby underwater as well. And he, so, you know, Graham went with the idea that these were unusual natural formations that may have been worked by people and then utilized. Yeah, it's it was, I've definitely heard what both of them have to say on that, and it both of them are uh, pretty uh, are pretty emphatic. Uh, a, a Graham uh, certainly seemed to be um, uh, more than receptive to the idea. I mean, he he seemed to basically uh, buy into the idea that those were indeed uh, uh, human uh, human created remains. Uh, but anyway, you just <laughs> that's what of. That's one of the things that make this makes this field interesting. Yes, yeah. Yet it has room for different schools of thought on a lot of these uh, on a lot of these things. Well, yeah, absolutely. And we're not going to get anywhere without asking questions. That's true. Um, That's what you do. <laughs> so one of the really interesting things you talk about in the book uh, is the me- Miocene wheel ruts. Oh yeah, yeah. And now again, I'm trying to remember that. I, I. Notice that um, that uh, the work of that particular uh, uh, archaeologist. He's a he's a Russian. A lot of other people ignore him, but frankly, I think that his uh, uh, I think he's got some really interesting evidence that's pretty darn hard to explain. Uh, these are these uh, these wheel ruts are all uh, petrified and uh, appear to be. They could be millions of years old. I, I said that, and this, and they're, uh, and they run across. In many cases, they're they're faults that run through some of these wheel ruts, and they appear to have a uh, you know a, 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 a gauge or a, a width between them. They're in pairs, which seems clearly uh, uh, you know to be evidence of, of some kind of conveyance. And uh, frankly, uh, he thinks uh, he, uh, that uh, they were probably, uh, they may have been, uh, uh, you know, uh, heavy equipment. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he really uh, runs with the idea. He obviously doesn't feel uh, constrained by conventional wisdom. <laughs> but I, I, I frankly, I, I, find, I find his evidence unexplained anywhere else. And that's one of the reasons that I... That I uh, that I featured it in the book, and uh, there's somewhere in the Mediterranean. Uh, what am I thinking of? Uh, is it oh, man where they have wheel ruts as well? It's where the hyper be hyper. Uh, see now my brain's doing it. Well, uh, yeah, you know it must be catching. But, <laughs> but yeah, the uh, it, it, this um, and you would ask me about this guy because there again his uh, I, his name escapes me. But he did talk about, uh, I think, uh, in, in I believe it was Malta. Yes, and, Malta. And, uh, and uh, uh, several locations, including Turkey. A lot of these, a lot of these are in the vicinity of. Uh, with, uh, uh, they're not far from Gobekli Tepe, for example, and some of the other uh, sites in Turkey, and and possibly may have been uh, uh, created by this by the same culture. I think. Certainly, if uh, oh, and some of the underground uh, uh, sites in in Turkey that have come to light lately, where um, you have uh, gigantic uh, facilities, multiple stories uh, underground, and uh, people try to say, well, it was done by the Romans and yeah. so forth. It, it, there's no evidence of that, and they obviously they may have been occupied. Uh, by uh, probably were occupied many times, and I think a lot of the facilities that we find the underground thing that's what you're seeing is the work of, of maybe much earlier, at least megalithic uh, societies that uh, then was later on reused by their uh, descendants or generations or maybe uh, centuries or even millennia later 
And now, today, we look at it and we give credit to the most recent occupant. Right, uh, right. And uh, there, that's, uh, that, I think there's certainly, that's certainly true in Peru. I think that a lot of, uh, of what you see there in terms of the, uh, uh, the Incan uh, civilization, a lot of that was just the reworking of, uh, of, of far more ancient and much more advanced uh, uh, abilities uh, which uh, preceded them. I, uh, with the, um, I just lost what I was going to say. All right, cool. Um, <laughs> I'm not a good influence. I can see that. <laughs> it, it, it happens anyway. It really does. Um, let, let, let's jump to some other type of stuff here. Um, you talk a little bit, well, let, let, let's look at Mars. What, what, what do you think about Mars as far as the structures well, and stuff there? I, I, there again, I found that I've always found it. Uh, I I got fascinated by the uh, uh, Richard Hoagland's uh, work there on the monuments of Mars back in the uh, back in the nineties, in the early nineties. Yeah, and and uh, then I think that uh, and his work with Mike Barra is 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 very interesting. And I, you know, we we uh, use a lot of uh, uh, John Brandenburg's uh, research in the book. Brandenburg is a, uh, a nuclear physicist and basically was uh, worked for uh, for NASA. But he found evidence of uh, nuclear explosions on yeah. Mars, and uh, he did his book uh, "Dead Mars, Dying Earth" back in the nineties, and he's done a couple more. Uh, since then, but uh, I mean, he's got you know very very uh, powerful uh, 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 evidence there, and I think that when you combine and and Hoechlin was uh, trying to make the point that uh, in Mars and in the in the area you're looking at aftermath for cat catastrophic cataclysmic events. Yeah, and the the esoteric story has always been that the asteroid belt uh, between Mars and Jupiter was the uh, was the product of uh, of a destroyed planet, mm -hmm. and that uh, and of course uh, that uh, it was in it's called different things, but uh, a hedron was the was the uh, was the name given to it in, in some of by I believe the Theosophists, and it's a uh, that's what uh, accounts for a lot of what we're uh, a lot of what we're seeing there. It's we ha we have a pretty good chapter on that in the book, and uh, a lot of uh, of uh, a pretty good interesting uh, theory, I think from. Uh, from Hoagland and Mike Barra on what could have happened. And, uh, of course, this all fits into uh, the catastrophist notion of history that you get from uh, originally begun by people like Emanuel Velikovsky. Uh, but, and, of course, that's the whole idea is that the story of the solar system not just the story of Earth, but the story of all of the other planets in the solar system is one of, of, uh, of immense catastrophic events. And of yeah. course, we all we all got a chance to see that when uh, Comet uh, Shoemaker Levy uh, plunged into uh, Jupiter. It was if that had happened to Earth, you know, that would have been that would have been it. it. Yeah, we would have become the an asteroid belt, and uh, <laughs> uh, of course, uh, Jupiter, of course, does play a role in protecting Earth from some of these kinds of impacts because uh, I think some of the uh, the extraterrestrial objects that come into the solar system get uh, uh, pulled toward that. Yeah. That is drawn to the uh, Jupiter's gravity, and uh, and therefore they never make it as far as Earth, 
which is interesting, you know, if you're, uh, you know, that, that uh, Oumuamua mm -hmm. um, uh, a story that uh, Dr. Loeb from, uh, from uh, Harvard is now uh, promoting uh, as evidence of, uh, you know, of, of extraterrestrial uh, intelligence. I think it fits into this, into this picture. It happened after we, we did the book, so and we didn't mention it in the book, but uh, I think it's, it's further, further corroboration of, uh, of a, I mean, I'm not saying Oumuamua, uh, obviously wherever it's coming from, it's far, far away. Right. A galaxy, except uh, probably another galaxy. So, but it's just evidence, you might say, of something like that, uh, which uh, might, might account for some of the things that we observe. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, uh, let's come back down to earth a bit. Um, what are your thoughts on the crop circles? Um, I know some people will say that they're all faked. Um, it seems to me that there are some natural form or some, some not man-made formations, even if there a lot of them are man-made and even the people making them seem to have weird experiences when they're making them. Yeah. I, I think that there's something there. Uh, I, I think that, uh, I mean, they are so, uh, it's it, when you think about it, about it, it is so mind blowing to most people that they have to explain it away uh, because if you uh, if you if you you if you accept the true implications that there is some kind of attempt to communicate with us coming from some other dimension or some other some other world, which is it's either that or they're fake, one or the other. But the faith thing is hard to make that work. I mean, clearly, the the Doug and Dave, uh, the two uh, uh, barflies who said that they had created all the uh, all the crop circles. Uh, I think you have to kind of write that off. Yeah, it, it yeah. Was, they were. It was like the rooster cr claiming credit for the sunrise, and. <laughs> uh, it's in the same in the same category, but I think that uh, certainly uh, the uh, um, there are things about the. I remember there's one one crop circle in, uh, in particular that had about fourteen hundred circles in it, and mm. spread out over a couple of uh, a couple of acres, and or or more than uh, more than that, and so. Okay, so you want to say that was that someone faked that? Well, to fake it, they would have to do it in a couple of. They would have had it done it in a matter of two or three hours. They would have had to have done it overnight, when it was a rainy night, and and, and there are many other examples of this. And logistically, it's very very difficult. Uh, I mean, okay, so they've got some kinds of tricks we don't understand that they can do. But I tell you what, if if there is something that the crops circle makers that gives them the ability to do that, uh, then there is a, uh, then I would say our technology, our, our society needs their help <laughs> because they can do some stuff that's pretty impressive. And, uh, and I think that, uh, frankly, there's something going on there and I, I'm just trying to be, uh, uh, he be as open-minded as possible about the possibilities, but uh, I th I think that there's something to it. Well, and I, and I love when those two guys took credit. First of all, you had tons of crop circles appearing overnight all over the country, and they were claiming to have made them all. That yeah. that that would be pretty impressive and to start with because they must have a teleporter. Um, right. And when they were asked why they started doing it, they referred to the saucer nests down in Australia where they grew up which were basically crop circles. You know, they're like, oh, these things would appear in, you know, in, where we lived. And it's like, so you're saying you were mimicking a real phenomena. Yeah. Well, there are a lot of problems with this story. Oh, <laughs> well, yes. 
And of course, you know, people did start making them after a certain point because, they, you know, there are competitions or stuff like that. I know Andrew Collins said that a lot of them, uh, circle makers will put their signature in them if you know where to look for it. Yeah, I believe that. I, and I, I think that they, they found ways of doing it. I, I'm not sure. But there are some that defy explanation. Yes, there are some very weird ones. But I also... And, uh, and there are some of the some of the research uh, uh, was uh, that showed what happened to the to the stalks and so forth of the uh, of the plants and so forth has been was uh, was pretty thoroughly examined. I thought, and and they hadn't really they didn't really answer the the uh, the science indicates that there was something there, whether they uh, whether they uh, that was beyond explanation. Yeah, because weren't they like heated and changed, like as if they were exposed to plasma or something? Yeah, there, something along those lines, and uh, I think that uh, you have to uh, you have to really struggle to come up with uh, with another with another explanation for that. And the other explanation, as far as I'm concerned, whatever explanation they come up with, is just as far fetched as the as the notion they're trying to explain away. They, they can't come up with a simple explanation. They can only come up with a highly complex one. Yes. Yeah. And that's always amusing to me when the, the skeptics will come up with this completely irrational explanation, but it fits with their worldview. So that right. must be what's happening. Exactly. Uh, and and let, let, let's talk a little bit about that and like the concept of peer review, because peer review... <sighs> I mean, from the studies I've seen on peer review, it is basically broken at this point. Um, I've seen studies where they said that they would take a paper and put a big name university and stuff on it, and it would be absolute nonsense, and it would pass peer review. And then they take the same paper and put a small university's name on it, and, and you know, make it look very minor league, and it would get rejected in peer review. And it was the same paper. It's a political uh, process at work, and. Uh, you know, I we did I, I did a story on this in the magazine. It didn't mention in the book, but uh, uh, where uh, people were playing games with this process and generating essentially uh, uh, nonsense or gobbledygook type paper, papers, right? And publishing them and and fooling uh, you know and and, and fooling people with. Uh, the legit le, the legitimacy of what they were what they were offering, uh, and of course the serious thing is what you get into with uh, say Wikipedia, where you have uh, a uh, a essentially a kind of a cabal or a, uh, a group of, uh, of unaccountable editors yeah. who are basically able to. Uh, approve or disapprove inclusion of certain ideas and basically then are using it to to assert their own worldview and to block out others in fact that of course is what you're seeing now i must say with the woke culture and and uh, it, uh a political correctness gone amok yeah and where at there it, and it's a sign of uh, deep corruption uh, of the of a process that is supposed to be uh, to have uh, integrity and clearly uh, extraneous uh, matters like uh, say uh, money are are basically corrupting the process and leading to and you can't trust what you get yeah and that of course is a very very serious uh, situation in which we find ourselves. Well, and I mean, the thing is, no one should be using uh, Wikipedia for hard research anyway. I mean, if you want to find out something simple like, oh, what, wh where did this band come from? Okay, well, you can look that up. That's, you know, probably going to be mostly accurate. But especially with anything that is questionable science-wise, any of the stuff we cover on the show, any of the, the stuff that's uh, alternative, uh, they will, I mean, the, the Wikipedia entries are literally... Uh, sanitized to make this stuff look like nonsense. Oh yeah, and and they and of course the games they play with uh, the people that they decide to discredit. I'm thinking particularly about say Rupert Sheldrake, right? Who's 
who's a, a very good example of this and who's, you know, I don't see how you could come up with a scientist who is, has more uh, uh, credibility uh, in my view than Rupert Sheldrake. And of course, he's certainly say nothing of his training at, uh, at Cambridge and, and, uh, and elsewhere and all the, all the, the work he's done uh, and then to simply dismiss his conclusions because he doesn't fit and and game and what Wikipedia does with him and there are several others we were talking about they do the same with with Robert Schock uh, they do the same they basically treat them as just being fringe uh, uh, researchers. Uh, researchers who are basically pushing some kind of some kind of weird idea. And they do this, they do it with uh, Nobel Prize winners. Uh, Hugo Ulfen is, uh, uh, comes to mind. I, I, I did this story, I don't, uh, we didn't get into it in the book, but one of the things we pursued here was like homeopathy, which is, and of course, that's totally rejected by Wikipedia, and they try to, to poo-poo it, and, and, re, and, and because... It's, there is no way you can explain it in, within the orthodox uh, uh, way of looking at things. I mean, the idea that water has a memory, for example, and that, uh, uh, and, 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 and therefore, and if you can get, uh, it, it is capable of, of effects that uh, are essentially uh, uh, impossible, according to the main, mainstream school of things. Uh, uh, I think uh, the trying to remember the, the the name of the researcher who did the uh, he actually dis- discovered uh, the AIDS uh, uh, vaccine, but who and did a lot of research on uh, homeopathy, and he won the Nobel Prize for his work on AIDS, and uh, and he definitely says, well, there is there's something to it, and. Uh, and if you really want to get to the bottom, uh, and of course that's that is just impossible for these people to accept. I mean, uh, they're definitely ready to burn that book. <laughs> and anything along those lines, and that's the mindset that we're dealing with. And it's for such people, it's actually it's it's impossible for them to to uh, be receptive to some of the things that we're trying to say here. The, uh, and, and it's funny because, you know, you say, okay, water has a memory, which is, isn't that kind of what, um, uh, like holy water is in a sense? Uh, well, yeah, I think you could say that, but they would, they would, they would treat it as, as, as you know, as being kind of religious superstition. Right, but I'm saying there are probably religious people who will accept holy water, but wouldn't accept that water has a memory. Yeah, that that that's that's true. However, I think most of the uh, most of the opposition now to such things doesn't come from the religious. I mean, I I think that anybody who is spiritually inclined has a, has a place in their heart or in their mind. For understanding some of these things, and I think that we basically uh, need to uh, 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 we need to uh, to respect them. Uh, I, I I'm not trying to uh, I'm not defending the, uh, the I'm not defending holy water. <laughs> no, no. I'm, I, I'm just saying that uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, people who look at the world through a spiritual lens. Uh, can they can readily accept ideas like uh, water having a memory, as well as uh, as well as uh, the the efficacy of holy water. <laughs> so so, so uh, on on the subject of Sheldrake, let's talk a little bit about his morphic resonance idea, which is, I mean, does explain some things that science has a lot of problems with. Oh yeah, no, Shel- Sheldrake is definitely. Uh, uh, got a has got a good handle on it that's for sure and that concept is that at a certain point knowledge will spread to other members of the species because they all kind of have this resonance with one another exactly 
And I think yeah. the the experiment wasn't the experiment like two islands in the Pacific that had the same type of monkeys on it, and they taught one island of monkeys to fish, and then all of a sudden all the monkeys knew how to fish on both islands, even though they 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 were too far away to communicate with one another. He did uh, there. He did a number of experiments uh, on that. It's been he uh, proving that uh, that. Uh, that once one part of a of a group or species learns something, that it becomes immediately becomes easier for others, and I think that uh, we're seeing that uh, uh, pretty much across the board these days. But anyway, that's, I mean, uh, you could almost say that with the the way that young kids pick up using electronics nowadays. Sure. No, I think it is an ex- it that is morphic rev- resonance or the that in. Uh, in the, in the process other stuff here i wanted to bring that i wrote this down and i don't remember what it was the rich hat structure oh that's the uh the circle in the uh in the sahara there the uh cross uh where it it it's it, um nobody's quite sure how uh what created it but it seems to conform to the uh, uh circular structure of atlantis that uh, plato described Right, and uh, it uh, I know that uh, it was something that was originally discovered by Gemini astronauts, I believe, in the '60s, and uh, it it has uh, concentric concentric circles. Uh, this is in I believe in Mauritania, in the in the in the uh, Sahara Desert. Yeah, that was what I was trying to think of earlier, and I couldn't remember where it was. So yeah, that that is one of the locations people think might have been Atlantis. Yeah, and it, it uh, I think that um, it goes along with the idea that, uh, uh, and there's evidence for this that certainly the Sahara, you know, twenty thousand years ago, was uh, was a, um, a lush, green, uh, life giving area. Mm-hmm. And that it appears to go through cycles like that of every every twenty thousand years or so. There's evidence of that that they've been able to bring up from from the uh, well from the floor of the Mediterranean, among other places. And that uh, uh, it's uh, that's that's what the uh, uh, the implications are. Now, has anyone actually like went out there and looked at that closely to see what we're looking at? You know, the person who promoted this strongly, in fact, got. Uh, brought it to most people's attention was Jimmy Bright, who has a, uh, who has his own uh, podcast, uh, uh, Bright Insights, he calls it, and, uh, and he's talked a lot about this, and, <clears throat> and um, I, I think that I don't, uh, there are a few people who have looked at it, I don't know if it's had any kind of a uh, real, I don't believe it's had any real scientific investigation, uh, nothing of that, uh, and I don't think anybody. I haven't heard of anybody pr- pr- producing any artifacts mm, okay. or anything that uh, you could uh, confidently say that was the work of some civilization. <coughs> but it does conform in terms of its dimensions, <coughs> right? And its overall its overall shape. It's very uh, curious. There, it really does seem to match uh, what Plato described. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, so uh, Edward Casey. What What are your thoughts on Edward Casey? You mean Ed, Edgar Casey? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I. I mean, I think he's someone you definitely have to listen to. He's certainly uh, uh, produced a a lot of uh, a lot of material uh, in his readings that was uh, that uh, creates a lot of uh, mysteries for people to. Uh, and I think that, uh, I mean, it was Casey's description of, uh, Poseidon and, uh, the, well, the idea of the, uh, uh, excuse me, the hall of records is one of the things that he was uh, a big promoter for. And, uh, he believed, and it was Casey who said that, uh, he thought there was a, uh, a hall of records uh, beneath the sinks, and they, he actually thought there was another one as well in uh, 
in uh, Central America. Right. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, that's the, uh, I, I mean, Casey uh, produced a ton of material over, over, over many years. And uh, people are still pouring over the, uh, uh, the transcripts of all of those, uh, of all of the commentary that he made. And uh, he talked about, uh, he provided a lot of details. Most of it, uh, when he talked about Atlantis, it was kind of indirect. That, for example, he would be talking to someone about his, uh, his health issues and then he would uh, explain some of the uh, uh, some of the issues in terms of events and places uh, and things that happened uh, in Atlantis. Oh, I guess I didn't and, realize uh, that. Yeah, he, he he had a lot to say about Atlantis. I mean, uh, and uh, the the organization there in Virginia Beach, the Association for Research and Enlightenment. Uh, they, uh, they've done a, a tremendous amount of, uh, of uh, research in, in Egypt, among other places, which is basically following up on, uh, on uh, comments from Edgar Cayce. I mean, it was Edgar Cayce who said to expect the rise of Atlantis uh, in, the, in, the, in the 60s. Yeah, it didn't, uh, and some people think that that's uh, the, the the Bimini Road uh, was basically uh, a fulfillment of that prophecy. Yeah, and that uh, I, there's uh, people like Greg Little, for example, and others who were uh, part of the uh, of the uh, who associated or associated with the the Casey people. Uh, have done a, tr a lot of their research is uh, basically validating Casey. Hmm. The, uh, do you think if we if uh, the uh, Egyptian Egyptology, the mainstream Egyptology, actually found a hall of records that contradicted their narrative, that they would ever tell us? <laughs> I have my doubts. Yeah. However, I think that uh, something like that might be hard to keep secret. Maybe. Isn't, isn't there a chamber inside the Sphinx from the back or something, like from the top back of it, that they have pictures of but isn't acknowledged? Oh, yeah. There's a, there, yeah, there's there's actually a lot of, uh, of uh, underground uh, uh, areas beneath the Sphinx. Uh, I'm, not a, uh, I'm not a good source on that as well, but I, yeah. Hmm. And, and, of course... We have uh, one of the articles uh, that uh, is uh, based on Shock's uh, uh, and uh, his his uh, research with uh, with uh, Robert Boval and uh, uh, Dr. Safeda, who are basically uh, coming up with uh, evidence of a chamber right. in uh, in uh, beneath the sinks, and they're talking about beneath the I believe the right paw of the sphinx, and if you can look at our chapter in the uh, on the, uh, the search for lost records, chapter three, uh, you get a lot of uh, we we kind of break that down the whole the whole story of that. Hmm. Um. Yeah, I just I don't know. I guess I don't trust them to to tell us some of this stuff. Like well, almost, I, I almost worry they would destroy stuff rather than let it out. Yeah. Well, I think you're uh, you you have good reason to be uh, to be concerned. There. <laughs> and and I know I saw pictures at some point that someone had put up of them of of a hatch in the back part of the Sphinx that goes down inside the Sphinx, but there doesn't seem to be much records of it anywhere. Yeah, some of that I think is is fairly well documented. Uh, certainly, uh, and you can get. Uh, uh, I'm not providing you with a good source of where to go to get this, uh, uh, but um, you can you can uh, you can get um, a lot of that online. Yeah, I yeah. I think that uh, actually uh, uh, Jimmy Bright is a pretty good source on this. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, do you have plans on another book at any point? Uh, 
Well, I got to recover from this one first. I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I would like to, but uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I'm basically facing a lot of, uh, of, uh, I'm reaching an age where I'm not as ready to shoulder that kind of uh, responsibility as quickly as I might have at one time. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. You'll, uh, you'll, so, you'll, you'll cross this bridge someday. <laughs> so the book is Ghosts of Atlantis, How the Echoes of Lost Civilizations Influence Our Modern World. I highly recommend it. It's a very, it's, it's about uh, 436 pages and it's, uh, actually a very easy read. You break stuff down and it moves very, very quickly through here. And this, it, would you say the majority of this comes from your experience with the Atlantis Rising magazine? Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's uh, it, it's a distillation of of uh, of uh, research that we did over the years, and we did a lot of. Uh, we always tried to be very scientific and to uh, to base what we did on real research, and uh, you know where uh, there are you know where there are uh, peer reviewed legitimately peer-reviewed materials to uh to back up a lot of what we said yeah and we pulled it in from a lot of different sources so i think it's a uh, it's uh we thought it was a pretty good read when we got done <laughs> <laughs> it is it definitely is um atlantis rising is it still available online uh it's available uh, the issues that we published uh you can get it come to our website at atlantisrising.com and uh, most of our issues uh, are available as PDFs, and um, and you can uh, uh, and we're doing uh, we're constantly putting we're, we're doing a lot of work now with putting uh, uh, a lot of our articles into audio form. Oh, so that uh, and they're available on YouTube. Oh, that's as, um, yeah. I think that you'll find it. You check it out. You find it entertaining. That's that's a really cool idea. Uh, is there anything yeah. else that, that like any other web presence for you? Well, it, mostly it's AtlantisRising dot com and also in our YouTube channel Atlantis Rising Research Rep uh, Research uh, Group and Atlantis Rising Research Report. Uh, the Atlantis Rising Research Group is our uh, uh, our our YouTube channel, and uh, we're getting we've already got. Uh, uh, quite a bit of material up and we're going to be uh, we're going to keep adding now and see just how far we can take this we've nice. got a lot of good nice okay well thank you for spending this time with me I enjoyed it you're <laughs> it's nice to talk to somebody who is really uh, receptive to the point of view we're trying to get across you know also before you go I want to recommend your other books from a few years ago your forbidden series oh yeah because I loved those. <coughs> you had forbidden, well, forbidden religion, forbidden science, and forbidden history, right? Those are the ones. Yeah, and, uh, you can still get them. Uh, or, or I don't know about forbidden religion, but you can get uh, forbidden science and forbidden history. Uh, they're still uh, they're still available. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Soraya. Great talking to you. I want to take a moment here to give a special shout out to those patrons pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Super Inframan, Eric Hervin, Tim, Andrew Nichols, The 100th Monkey Project, a blue second gen MR2 drifting around a Japanese mountain, Patricia Gaia Quinta, Alex Whitcomb, American Rambler, Andrew Maines, Barbara Fisher, Beverly Williamson, Big Boy Limina, Charles Davis, Charles in Florida, Land of the Crazy Incommunicable, Christopher Ernst, Craig Cicernos, Craig Parmenter, Crystal Ann Compton, David Moore, Denise Sarek, Diane B., Diona Bidwell, Dominic O'Malley, Duffy Doubter, Edu Camahort, MTK, Eric Citron, Eric Todd, J. Otto Bullet, James Lattimore, Johanna Rojas, John W. Bracken, Carla Mahoney, Kevin, Kevin Shrek, Kristen L., 
Linz Jackson K, Luke Osborne, Mark Bowley, Mark Brady, Matt in Delaware, Matthew Sproul, Patricia W, Paul Jeffries, Ray Benedetto, Riker and Stark, Roger Gonzalez, Sam Sharon, Sedgder, Stone Wilderness, Tactical Therapist, Taylor Bell, 36 Dingo, Thunderboy, Tyler Glimstead, Vincent Trewell, Walker, Will Gebhard, Will Powell, William Lovelace, Ren Collier, and Stephen D. Thank you all so very much for your awesome support, and thank you to all of my patrons, because without you, this show would not be possible. All right. I do not have a Patreon segment uh, for this particular show, but I have one from a few months ago that I never aired. So I'm going to put that up this coming week for Patreons. If you want to become a Patreon, where did the road go.com and just click on the Patreon link. And it's only $3 a month. and You get extra content almost every week. And like I said before, the occasional gift or extra things. Plus we do AMA shows here and there, which I may do one public one soon. But uh, if you're a patron, you get an AMA show every couple of, every few months usually. I'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.